Hello friends. Thanks for joining us today. A little different look here for Worship Alive today. Pastor Rick Mercer is um, busy with the funeral. Uh, unfortunately, this afternoon for some of our friends, I had a mom passed away. So I'd like to introduce on your right is my mother, Roberta Yegley. I'm Brian Yegley and my daughter, Jamie Short. And if you've kind of looked at the, the theme, perhaps, uh, as you've been watching the advertising, we're going to be talking about family legacy, legacy that comes out of marriage and family. And so, as you can tell, there are three generations here at the table today. So before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your love for each one of us and how your love is exhibited to each one of us through our marriages, through our families. And as we talk about and we recollect uh, things that uh, have been passed down through our specific family, Lord, we want you to be glorified. In thy name, amen. Before I begin today and share a couple texts, I'd like to share a story with you. It's a story that I grew up hearing, boy, since I was a little boy. Uh, my dad grew up in Pennsylvania and his mom and dad were farmers, but they didn't own the farm that they worked on. They worked for another individual and uh, they stayed on his land. They lived in the farmhouse, they had the barn. And uh, obviously at the end of the year, as the crops came in and things like that, they would share the proceeds. So it was, uh, it was a way to make a living and there were a lot of kids in the family, but uh, it was not necessarily a fat uh, way to make a living. And the story is told, and it's true, in our family of one night in the middle of the night, there was a banging on the door, people shouting, hollering, the barn's on fire, the barn's on fire. And of course, everybody in the house gets up, and sure enough, the barn is on fire. And um, there are those who believe that the reason that these two gentlemen that knocked on the door in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere, out in the country, would have known that the barn was on fire was that potentially they were in the barn, hobos, whatever, whatever it was, but never really truly figured that out. But there wasn't much to fight the fire with. They lost a lot of things in the, far, in, the, in the barn, but they did their best to get stuff out. And for many years, that was kind of the end of the story until not too terribly long before my grandfather um, died. My dad one time asked him, he said, Daddy, he said, after the barn burned, he said, we didn't know where you were. He said, we thought perhaps for a little while that you may have gotten trapped in the barn and, and died in the barn fire. And, they, and my dad said, where were you that night after the barn burned? And what he told my dad has stuck with me. And this is an idea of legacy. This is an idea of how in families and in marriages, uh, faith has passed down. He told my dad, my grandpa did, he said, I was out back of the barn, laying down in the grass, that wet grass in the middle of the night, crying to God, going, what am I going to do now? He had all these kids. He said, "My, uh, the barn that belonged to another individual had just burned to the ground, and his income, he didn't know where it was going to come from. And so here is my grandpa, out back, begging with God, Please, what, what am I going to do now? How, how are we going to survive as a family? And that story has stuck with me. Um, and so I'd like to share two verses before the three of us are just going to do some reminiscing and kind of illustrate how the legacy of marriages, the legacy of family is such a powerful thing in our lives. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Genesis 17:7. We're going to be here where Abraham, God is talking to Abraham in this particular verse, and he's made a covenant with him. And uh, here's what Genesis 17, 7 says. This is uh, God talking to him, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. He's basically telling Abraham I make a covenant with you, and I want that covenant to be passed down from generation to generation to generation. That covenant of love, that covenant that said that God would be with them. 
God is saying, I'm going to use the vehicle of grandparents to parents to children, etc., through the generations so that my love can be seen to everyone. And then if you have a, a Bible, turn over to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6. And this is one of my favorites because as a grandfather myself of three little uh, kids, I often wondered, what is it that God wants me to do? What's my role now as a grandfather? I knew what it was, my role was when Jamie and, and her sister Erin were young, but what's my role now? So Deuteronomy 6, and I'm going to read verses 4 through 9. Simply says this, Hear, O Israel, and this is being spoken, excuse me, to the children of Israel. They've wandered in the wilderness. They've gone through some terrible times, crossed the Red Sea, uh, getting out of Egypt, uh, 40 years of wandering. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And this is, this is I love this right here. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So there's the challenge. There's the call that needs to go down through the generations. So how does that work? It says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your, ho in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts um, of your house and on your gates. And what that text is saying is your faith needs to be lived out in your life. Your faith needs to be evident in what you say, what you do, in your home, in your, your wanderings around, whatever it is you do, your life um, should exude the love that God wants passed down through the generations. So I want to do something, um, and that is share. I think I just threw something on the floor that I wasn't supposed to, but that's okay. Life will go on. Nothing like live television, right? So I have some questions that Jamie and my mom and myself are going to answer. And the questions really had to do with how, through the generations, do we pass on the legacy? How do we pass on the love of God that we've seen in these texts here? And so I want to, I want to start with something. I want to ask, how have tough times, in, over the generations, how have the tough times shared your family, uh, excuse me, shaped your family legacy? Shaped you. Oh, they're going to let me start with this one. All right. <laughs> I think whenever you have a, a death in the immediate family, that can, that can shake your faith. But we learned that God is with you no matter what happens. So when we lost our oldest son, it did shape our legacy because we had to learn how to deal with something that... Um, my parents had had to. They had lost my brother a number of years mm -hmm. before. And so I now knew that they understood to a great extent what we were experiencing. So tough times do help. You either pull apart or you draw together. And I think that makes a difference when you're going through tough times. Because God does promise to be with you no matter what happens. And I think that when, you know, of course, for all three of the other brothers in our family, we went through the same thing. Yes, but I think that when you go through something like that, um, it changes you, it's, it hopefully strengthens you, and, and it then becomes a story that can be passed down through the ages as far as, as what God did in those tough times. Yes, I agree. A story that for me that's a little, not as dramatic, <laughs> But I remember since a little boy hearing this story um, in, in the faith that we are the Seventh-day Adventist Church, pastors get paid once a month. And that was the case for my mom and dad. My, my oldest brother, Jeff, was the only one of us four boys around at that point. And um, they got to the point at the end of that four-week pay cycle where they were still a few days off from the next paycheck. 
And there was food in the house for my mom and dad, but there wasn't money in the pocketbook or the wallet to buy milk for my brother Jeff. And the story that I have heard for a long time was that a lot of prayers going on, but then there's a lot of couch surfing, looking <laughs> under cushions, looking in coat pockets. And the Lord led them to enough money to buy milk for my brother Jeff. And for some reason, as a little boy, that, that story just captivated me that God would step in and intervene in a very difficult time, providing literally providing food for my brother, Jeff. I think for me, this question takes a totally different approach because we haven't had, like as a young family, we haven't had those tough times, like, like what I would think of. Um, you know, we've been through a little bit with struggling to find work. Um, I think everybody's gone through tough times here lately with COVID, but it's been totally manageable, totally different. But as I've thought about it, I think in many ways it's because you guys have had your tough times that you've gone through, the times when there wasn't enough money or wasn't enough food, things that you've had to work through that um, now you're set up to help us. And I don't think that we're out of the woods, so to speak. I think <laughs> tough times could come for our family, but now as as our parents and grandparents have shared with us, we know that we'll have what we need to to get through so that then when our kids are older, we can do the same for them. So that was kind of the thing that stuck out on this point for me was that I can't talk about a big loss in the family or haven't really known the times when there wasn't enough money to get the food <laughs> that we needed, but I know it's because we have our legacy that's there to, to watch out for us so that we can set ourselves up to be able to in turn do the same thing for our kids down the road. Yeah. You know, if you were to go on to you know, Google and search legacy, you would find a lot of websites that indicate that the word legacy has to do with money. And you're gonna notice we're not gonna talk about money today. Uh, there's no doubt that a legacy can come in the form of, of financial support. The kind of legacy we're talking about now is a legacy that um, extends to generations the love of God. It extends traditions and families. It's, it sustains families. It's something that is there whether or not funds are there. So legacy for us today is not really going to be looking at funding. Let me ask you a question. Um, Traditions. A lot of families, some of your families have traditions that you really, really enjoy. Traditions that have, have cemented and anchored your family over the generations. And Jamie, share with, with our audience, there's one that I know you want to talk about that meant a lot to you and your cousins. So in our family, um, there's 10 of us cousins. Um, and we started right off with the first one when any of us turned 12, we had a family blessing. And so for the blessing, the family would get together usually for a meal. Um, they would make us sit in the middle of the room and all of the adults in the family and even some of, as, as we got down the line to the younger ones, um, even some of the older cousins um, had all prepared letters. Um, and they would sit around and, and read the letters to us. Um, and the letters would um, typically would talk about um, each child's strengths and, and weaknesses and, and funny things about them, but um, would usually always wrap up with their blessing for that child and their um, giving their support and, and letting each child know that they would be there as their family, as their support system. Um, and we would collect all those letters and put them together um, in a little notebook to keep on hand if we ever, you know, got in a tough time and, and weren't sure what to do so that we could look back and know that we had our family's blessing mm -hmm. and support. I remember um, several years ago now, one of my brothers and sister-in-laws lost their house to a fire right before Christmas. And I remember standing out on the front lawn of their house um, watching the firemen put out the fire in their house and putting my arms around the one child who um, had already had his blessing. 
And it said, you remember back when we told you that we would be with you guys through thick or thin? And he goes, yeah. I said, this is what we're talking about. And it's funny, my other nephew standing next to me was 11. He wasn't quite, had not had his blessing. And I kind of joked with him. I said, well, it doesn't pertain to you. And he knew I was joking. But um, it, it, was a, it was a powerful thing. It was embarrassing for the kids, you know, they, to be the center of attention. But I asked one of my nephews today, I said, could you put your hands on the notebook that you got out of that blessing the night? He goes, absolutely. I still have it and I know where it is. You're gonna share one too. Well, I think that um, passing down a, a tradition as oftentimes is involved with food. Um, mm -hmm. In our family, there was one thing that we used to enjoy on Saturday nights. My grandmother grew up in Virginia and I suppose that was her southern roots and she liked to have cottage cheese with apple butter. Now, I know there's some people who just turn their nose way up at something like that. Good stuff. Try it. <laughs> um, and Brian found this out when he went to college, and he tried it out eating in the cafeteria with some of his friends. And as he said, you could tear off the table when you ate that. <laughs> but um, I'm going to jump and tell a story on him as well. Um, my mo I, We were quite particular about the amount of sweet cereal our boys ate, so there usually was very rarely any, sometimes for, for Sabbath, perhaps. But when they visited my mother, I guess she went to the store in preparation for our visit and bought, I think, every variety they had, knowing how much our boys liked it. So they knew that when they went to Grandma Brackett's house, that there was going to be sweet cereal everywhere. And they also knew that I would not say anything about it. So they would get to eat as much as they wanted. To them, that was a tradition. When Jamie was born, Brian said to me, now, are you going to carry on that tradition for Jamie? I said, well, I'll have to think about that. I don't know if I did or not. I don't remember now. But um, anyway, they enjoyed that particular tradition in our family. But all, all of you probably have family members who perhaps came from another country. And you have recipes of those foods that you sometimes make for special occasions. That is a true legacy in your family. Let's turn for a few minutes back to really kind of the, the basic foundation of what we're talking, and that is the spiritual side of passing on a legacy, passing on uh, from generation to generation uh, this covenant of love, this idea that God loves us. And so my question is, how has our faith, how has your faith been strengthened by traditions and, and legacy and, and generations of people in our family. Go ahead, Jamie. No, you go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to quote a verse, I read you a verse out of Psalms 145 and verse 4. And it says, One generation shall praise your work to another and declare his mighty acts. I think as I listened or read stories about that my grandfather, um, my paternal grandfather, was great at keeping a family history book, written many stories in there. And I was able to read those and realize that there were things in their lives that have blessed mine because of their courage and their faith. Um, I did not have the privilege of knowing my maternal grandparents because they died before I was born. But I think when we tell our kids stories of the way special things that God has done, or perhaps an answered prayer, it helps them to know, it helped me to know growing up, that you did pay attention to mm -hmm. things that we needed in our lives. Well, and I know that for my wife and I, um, we've had numerous things over the course of our marriage that have made God's providence, have made God's leading in our lives very evident. Some of those happened before our girls were even born. Some of those happened after they were born. And I know that they've heard those stories relayed. I know that they have heard, um, for each of us, there are stories that are kind of anchor points in our life, in our marriages. And I think it's important for our kids to know, number one, that God was there and that, that we sought his guidance and that 
because he was there, we trust him for the next curve, the next, uh, should we say, rough sledding that, that our families, our marriages, or our careers, whatever it is, will face. I think it's important. And um, for me, though, you know, when I was a little boy, my dad was a pastor. That meant that no matter where we moved, my pastor moved with me. You know, and uh, the joke was that the Yeagley boys all sat on the front row of church. Uh, that was yes, so that um, there was less distraction, but it also meant that my dad, if need be, could uh, keep us in line from the from the pulpit and uh, looking down the front row. But you know, my first pastor that I had growing up also shaped um, who I am, how I view God, how I view. Um, this word and what it means in my life. And so that's very, very much a way that generations have affected me as well. Okay, we're gonna have fun with this next question. <laughs> there's a saying that there's a skunk in every wood pile, meaning that in every family, there's that uncle or there's that individual on the family tree that you just kind of go, wow, we didn't, you know, where did he come from? Where did she come from? Um, my question is, can God use failed people in, in our legacy? We all have them. Be because the three of us are up here today does not mean that we have all of our ducks in a row. <laughs> it doesn't mean that, that we have no one in our past that you kind of shake your head at. Uh, my mom my mom can share one and I think she's going to attempt to here. When I grew up as a little girl, I knew that my great-grandmother was a sister to the Kellogg brothers. And I used to think, oh, I was somebody quite special because of that. Until I got a little older and learned that the Kellogg boys did not come without skunks in their woodpile. <laughs> and they did not get along very well with each other. They did not get along very well with the people who worked for them. And to the point that when we happened to live in Battle Creek at one time, I learned not to tell anybody that I was related to the Gallup brothers because there were people who had uh, unhappy opinions about them. So while they were not perhaps in some ways true skunks, and yet they created enough havoc in, in Battle Creek and in people's lives that it made me cautious about announcing my relationship to them. But both of those men accomplished a great deal in the world. Um, W.K., of course, you know about the Keller cereal factory going, and his brother, of course, was known for the hospital that he got started. So God can use everyone, no matter how difficult a person they might be. Yeah. I, this week, as I was kind of pulling some notes together, I ran across on a website um, a heading that was titled The Gnarled Family Tree of Jesus. And if we're not going to really read anything, but if you go to Matthew 1, that's the beginning of the Gospels. And that's where you're going to see that long, shall we say, perhaps boring genealogy that is 14 generations long. And, and we see painted in, in words this family tree. And um, Genesis, excuse me, Matthew 1.1 1, 1 says, the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And it begins with Abraham. But here's what I read and what really struck me when it talked about the gnarled family tree of Jesus. When it comes to skunks in our woodpile, when it comes to uh, individuals who say, yeah, that, that just seems to be a stain in my family's legacy down through the generations, listen to this. These are individuals in the family tree of our Savior. A liar, deceiver, schemer, faithful followers, murderers, adulterer, kinsman redeemer, idol worshipers, child sacrificers, reformers, polygamists, and a prostitute. Kind of makes the Kellogg boys look pretty good. <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is that if, if God can use these families, 
these individuals in that 14 generation from Abraham until the birth of Christ, if he can use those individuals, he can use you, he can use your family to build a legacy, to strengthen and to show Christ through the years. Okay, perhaps one or two more questions. Um, parenting. How has legacy, how, how have you through the generations seen parenting exhibited? How has it changed you as a parent? I mean, I think it, for everybody, how you were raised ultimately then becomes how you parent your own children. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of that obvious, um, whether you intend to or not, you pick up um, strategies and, and things from your, your parents and from what you've seen other family members do. But, uh, you know, then I know for me also there's the ability to go to my parents or my grandparents when I just don't know what to do with this issue or we're struggling with X, Y, Z and be able to talk through that um, and get advice, um, you know, just on the day-to-day -day parenting stuff. Uh, also, a big one, I think, for us is just the element of family time it has such a big impact on, mm -hmm. on our kids and the ability to, and I know not everybody gets this, and I guess, or it comes in different shapes and sizes, I guess, um, but the time spent with extended family and doing all these get-togethers has been so beneficial, I think, for n not only me growing up, but now for my kids. Um, and I read in a book one time, I think it was um, talking about um, actually Amish families and just talking about um, happy children. And that was one of the, the main points was lots of time with family. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever size family that is, I think that has a huge impact too. You know, it's funny because I, this, this, something just popped into my head. It's kind of a cute anecdote. My youngest granddaughter has an uncle who, who loves to pinch them. And uh, initially that was a little bit intimidating. You know, Harper was probably maybe two when this all started, I don't remember. But it's so interesting to me now, Harper loves this uncle. Mr. Pinchy. Mr. Pinchy, <laughs> as we called. He doesn't have, it's not an uncle this, he doesn't have a name, it's Pinchy. But it is this sense of, connection and that is a, it is a family issue but it also comes in the form of marriages it comes in the form of of extended family i want to read a text that we kind of wind down today uh, it's a text that my mom brought to my attention so i can't take credit for finding it but flipping your bible to first peter first peter 2 and verse 21 and um Perhaps you're saying, but Brian, I, I don't, there's not really been any good legacy or, or the, down through the generations in my family, there hasn't been anything worth hanging on or, or passing on. And this text, I think, gives you reason to stop and realize that there's hope. There's hope that maybe for you, you start today building a legacy that can be passed down through generations to come. And here's what 1 Peter 2.21 says, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. So there you have the ultimate, the ultimate uh, passing down of a legacy is that our Savior passes down to us an example of loving others and uh so i guess my challenge to you and i'll, I'll give anyone else a chance to, for closing thoughts but my challenge to you is if you haven't had much of this in your life christ gives you the first step he gives you an example that you can follow in your family in your marriage he gives you the example of things that you can hand on to your children to your grandchildren your great-grandchildren that will um, paint a picture of Christ that will, will extend for generations. I think the thing I would want to add is that 
Sometimes there are people outside of our nuclear family, our birth family, shall we say, who have tremendous impact on our own families, but we can be that kind of person for someone else too. Maybe they don't have someone in their family to be a legacy passer, if you will, but you can be the person who makes an impact on that person's life, that child's life, and that child will, you will be part of that child's legacy, mm -hmm. truly. Any closing thoughts, Jamie? No. No, okay. <laughs> well, folks, our prayer for you today is that um, starting with what Christ has done for each of us, that's the first step. That is Christ's first gift to you in starting a legacy in your marriage, in your family, in your extended family. And so if you have felt like there hasn't been anything to pass on, take courage, there is, because Christ died for each one of us. And he's saying, both in the New and the Old Testament, he's saying, I want you to share that. I want you to pass that down, not only in the spoken word and in your testimony, but in, in the family traditions and in your life and in, in bringing a circle of love around your family and around your marriage that will honor what Christ has done for each one of us. Let's pray as we close today. Our dear Heavenly Father, I pray for each person watching, for each family that is represented, for each marriage that is represented. Lord, you want nothing more than your love for us to be perfectly uh, lived out in each of our marriages and our families. Lord, we can only do that through your strength. And so we ask today that you would um, circle each person watching that you would strengthen them, that you would give them ideas for ways that their family can begin to live out and to pass on the great legacy of faith that you had given each one of us. In thy name, amen. Folks, we are so glad that you've joined us. Uh, hey, take a moment, maybe Wednesday at 7 o'clock, join us for a Bible study, and we'll be back here next week. God bless each one of you. Bye-bye. <laughs>